Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. I do encourage you to subscribe to the podcast with your favorite podcast software, such as Google Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives to make sure that you never miss an episode. Also, uh, listeners in the United States should be sure and check out The Amazing World of Radio, amazing.greatdetectives.net. That series is returning from hiatus with our Amazing World of Radio Thanksgiving special. And it'll be posted tomorrow over at amazing.greatdetectives.net. Well, now it's time for this week's episode of I Hate Crime. The original air date is 1950 or 1951. This is episode 74. Let's go ahead and listen. I hate crime. I was sitting in my office, time on my hands, bills on my desk. The guy who walked in had perspiration streaming down his face. He didn't bother to close the door, just stumble over to me like a marathon runner reaching the tape. He put his fist on the desk and then opened it. There was a smooth stone in the center of his palm. Keep, keep this. What is it? Very important. Charge it for me. Why? No time to talk. Money here. Come back to later. He turned around and left. I counted the money he'd pushed at me. Twenty-six pounds. Then I looked at the smooth piece of stone. It was oval-shaped, about the size of a duck egg. There was a word engraved on it. Victorio. I put it in my pocket. I didn't try to figure it out. I just waited. Nothing happened till the next day. Larry Kent, private investigation. Sorry, the man who gave you this stone. Oh? What happens next? I want this stone. Sure. Come up to my office. I cannot. Why not? I would rather see you somewhere else. Okay. Name it. There is a coffee shop near your building. The Checker Cafe. Yeah, I know it well. Can I see you there in five minutes? All right. I was sitting down with a cup of coffee before me when I spotted the guy. He turned sharply off the sidewalk and started through the doorway. Then he stopped short. He shivered like he had a cold. There was a surprised look on his face. When he turned, the reason for his shivering and surprise stuck way out, way out of his back. It was a knife. I pushed my way through the crowd. There was an old guy already near the body. He had a little black bag beside him. I am a doctor. Please stand back. Is he dead, Doc? There's a slight pulse. Don't want to carry him to the back room. A few of the others lifted the body, but I knew he was as good as dead. The knife went deep and must have pierced his heart. It could have been thrown from someone passing by on the sidewalk. I took one look at the swarming lunch hour crowd and gave it up. Then, I phoned the cops and went to the back room. The doctor was already gone. The dead man's clothes had been all but ripped from his body. I felt in my pocket. The little stone was there. And I wondered if that was what the fake doctor had been looking for. Later, at headquarters, there were questions. So, you were just sitting there when a man walked in and was murdered. That's right, Inspector. You never saw the man before. Nope. You are just having a cup of coffee. Yep. You sure? Uh Uh-huh. From experience, I know there's no sense in asking you any more questions, but... Yeah? Get out of here! I went. Maybe, as you might be figuring, I was wrong in not playing with the cops, but... What could they find out about a little piece of stone with Victoria written on it? Maybe I wouldn't be able to find out anything either, but... There was that little doctor who'd seen my face. 
If he was looking for the stone, he might come looking for me. In fact, I was expecting him. But I wasn't expecting the guy who came to my office the next day. Larry Kent? That's right. My credentials. William Goodwin, security police. I want to talk to you about Vincetti. Vincetti? Who's he? He went to see you at the Checker Cafe yesterday. I didn't see anybody there. Somebody put a knife in his back before he reached you. Oh, that guy. So Vincetti was his name, huh? You knew that. I didn't. Cross my heart. Don't play around. This is big stuff. Then why not tell me about it? There was a certain article Vincetti was carrying. What kind of an article? A stone with a word on it. Oh? What was the word? That's what security wants to find out. Why? I'm not permitted to tell you. But you know what it is, don't you? I haven't got the glimmer of an idea. He came to see you. How do you know? We've got ways of finding out. You're on the wrong track, Goodwin. Vince said he didn't give me anything. You'll be in trouble if you don't cooperate. I don't know a thing. You'll tell a... Oh, yeah! Oh! Reach for that gun again and I'll blow you in half with this one. You've let yourself in for a lot of grief. Hit the road. Show up again and I'll really get tough. You'll be hearing from us. I pushed him out. He wasn't from security, I knew that. Security agents don't show credentials to private eyes. Why didn't I turn him over to the cops? Well, how could I without spilling the story of the stone? So, I waited. Two days passed without anything interesting happening. On the third night, I was at the Canary Club. She walked into the place. She spoke to the head waiter who looked at a table near mine and led her over. Then she ordered, lighted a cigarette and glanced up into my eyes. She smiled. It was a friendly smile. When she didn't turn away, I walked over. Evening. Good evening. The uh, management doesn't like table hopping unless the parties are acquainted, so if I'm not wanted, will you just smile and let it go with that? Sit down, won't you? <laughs> That's even better. Alone? Mm-hmm. And you? Ditto. The name's Larry Kent. Mine is Wanda Norris. Dance. Wanda. Not too. Larry. So, we dance. After three hours of dancing and talk loaded heavily with promise, she decided it was time to go bye-bye. So, we went out to the parking lot. Lovely night. Oh, oh. Yeah, uh, What's I... What's wrong, Mary? I've got a headache. I'll give you something for it. At my place. Okay, uh... Can't keep my eyes open. Awful drowsy. Where's your car? Right here. Give me the keys. I'll drive if you're not feeling well. All right. Thanks. I got into the car and then she followed. I lay back on the seat. 
Larry. Uh, Are you asleep, Larry? <laughs> Sleep well. Twenty minutes later, she pulled to a stop on a dirt road. As far as I could make out, we were somewhere between the spit and D.Y. She sat there beside me, probably looking into my face. Then she left the car. In a few minutes, she was back, and there was somebody with her. Somebody I knew. The man who said he was from security. <laughs> Sleeping like a baby. He should be. I slipped a double dose of powder in his drink. Hey, I think I'll take care of him now. Must you? He knows about the stone. But we might get him to tell us where it is. If he's got it, we'll find it either on him, in his flat, or in his office later. One of my eyes was half open. I saw the bulky nozzle of a revolver moving upwards, a silence gun. He was bringing it in line with his eyes so he could take careful aim. But my gun had been in my lap. He went down and Wanda was standing there, her eyes like saucers. You're not... No, I'm not drugged. I dumped that drink into a potted palm. You knew all the time. That you were a decoy, I guessed it. And now you're going to tell me a lot more because you're going to talk. I don't know anything. Inside, we can hold a powwow. I I, I was just doing as I was told. I, I didn't think you'd go as far as murder. You're in this up to your soft, beautiful neck. No, I swear. I, I only... The shot whistled past. I hit the ground. I saw the second flash from behind a tree. There were no more flashes, but... Oh, oh. This time he will go to sleep. It was probably only minutes after Wanda slugged me when I came to. She'd used a rock. I found it nearby. Then I looked at Goodwin. Dead. I crossed over to the other fellow, the one near the tree. Ditto. I was just turning to search his pockets when I heard a motorcycle roaring along the road. <laughs> it was a cop apparently investigating the shots. I ran behind the house, and when he spotted Goodwin's body, I hit the road. On the main highway, about half a mile away, I was lucky enough to catch a bus to Winyard. Why didn't I stay there with the cop? Brother, the explaining I would have had to do would have kept me at headquarters for a week. I knew I'd have to go there sooner or later, but there was a job first. A waiting job. But the night passed and nobody approached my apartment. It happened the next morning in my office. Larry Kent speaking. Hello. This is Wanda. No kidding. Why didn't you crack my skull? Because I have more brains than Goodwin had. I searched your pockets. The stone wasn't on you. No, sir. I put it in a very safe place. Undoubtedly. Now listen. That stone means nothing to you. It evidently means a lot to you. I'll give you 500 pounds for it. Ha! Huh. A good main offender at the stadium gets that much for fighting one man. And knives and guns aren't allowed. Besides, how about the wear and tear on my car? You can have your car back, too. Oh, thanks. You have a thousand pounds. The stone. That's the highest price I can offer. Where do I deliver? At Rush Cutters Bay Park, where you can feel nice and safe. When? In, say, uh, 20 minutes. Say, uh, two hours. Why then? Because it'll be during lunch hour and there'll be people eating in the park. I like lots of people around me. You needn't worry. This is a straight-out business deal. Goodbye. So long. I moved quickly. A friend of mine had a rock garden, rocks of all shapes and sizes. I stole one that was almost the twin of the real stone. Then I took the new one to an engraver in a city arcade. He printed Victoria on it for me. Then, right on time, I was at the park. Wanda was sitting on a bench looking as pretty and as innocent as a junior typist. Your car is just over there, Larry. Thanks. Uh, how about the uh, do-re-mi, huh? How about the stone? Sure. 
Here. Thank you. The, uh, the dough. Here. Yeah. In five pound notes. Hmm. Are they real? Yes. Every one of them. Well, it's been a pleasure. Hold it. Don't try anything. I have a gun in my purse. I just want you to drive my car back and forth a few times. What? I want you to D-R-I-V-E my car. There might be a booby trap in it. You and your playmates have such a sweet sense of humor. We wouldn't be so crude. We? Never mind. I'll drive your car. If you stay at least ten feet away. I watched while she went back and forth with my car. Then she stopped and climbed out the opposite door. She walked away. When she was out of sight, I drove to the office. I didn't have the slightest idea what would happen next. At five o'clock, I put on my hat and started from the office. Close the door gently, if you please. If I do, will you promise not to stick me with that knife? Close the door. I hope this is gentle enough. It will do it. Now what? I wanted the stone. I gave it to your girlfriend, Wanda. It was the wrong one. Well, it was the only one I had. After a talk with us, you may remember that you have another one. Start walking, please. Stairway? Lift. Okay. Press the button. Sure. We're lucky. It was on the floor below. Walk to the back of the lift. I can watch you. Careful, aren't you? More careful than the others were. Now press the basement button. We can leave from there. And keep your finger on the button. I do not want the lift to stop on any other floor. Right. The floors started flashing by. Near the basement button was the one marked emergency stop. My thumb was inches away from it. Four floors down and I pushed my thumb. He went back against the wall but he still had the knife. I brought the heel of my shoe down on his wrist. It cost him a broken wrist. I grabbed him by the throat with my left hand. With my right hand, I pressed the top floor button. At least... There'll be other parts of you hurting before we're through unless you tell me a few things. Never. You'll change your mind. I half dragged him into my office where I flattened him against the wall. Where's Wanda? Find her. <coughs> Where is she? <coughs> Spell it or I close my fist. Okay, grease ball. <coughs> Either he had a glass jaw or I'd hit him too hard he was out. So I went through his pockets. Talk about luck. He was carrying a passport. His name was Tony Manello and he came from Naples. Huh. His occupation was interesting. He was a carnival operator. I trussed him up snugly, gagged him, and hung him on a hook in the built-in cupboard. Then I went looking for carnivals. After hours of fiddling, I found there were only two in the Sydney area. One was at Palm Beach. I went. Threw baseballs at toy dolls, won a plaster puppy worth about two cents, and gave it to a kid with a running nose. I saw nothing interesting, and so I went to the second carnival. It was at Paddington. It was a bigger affair than the first. There were chocolate wheels, a merry-go-round, a few other joy rides, and some side shows. They're the reason why men leave home. Come out and watch them dance, folks. Come out and see them. Three beauties who escaped from the hair of Abdullah, the mad sultan. Three gorgeous 
Irish pulsate beauties who wear the Sutton's favourites. Come in and see them do the secret dance to the seven bales for only one shilling, a bale at a time. It works out to the penny of ale or tuppence if you like it. There's a ticket box, a bump and knob. Don't rush it. The seat's full. I'd Rock. spotted the three Come beauties on. before they snaked their way inside the tent. One was short and fat, the other was thin and long, and the third, just right. They all wore veils, but once I dance with a dame, I don't forget her figure. That third one was Wanda. I went inside, but only two of them were dancing, so I left and skirted around the rear of the tent. I lifted a flap and walked in. There was a sort of a dressing room, and Wanda... What are you doing here? You knew I was here. Come on, sweetheart. I don't like mysteries when they drag too far. We're going to the cops. You're mistaken. I don't think so. I do. I turned and caught the flash of a flying knife blade. Oh, oh. Oh, my right arm was pinned to Wanda's dressing table. Do not try to use the lift or you get the second knife. Ah, the little doctor who looked at Vincetti's body. Where's the stone? You're pretty good with knives, aren't you? The stone. Uh, I gave it to Wanda. You didn't have what we wanted inside, so produce the real one, or you get the knife inside you. You, you were. You'll have to come along with me. The, the fellow I gave it to won't hand it to anybody else. He's lying, Renault. That's it. She started. When she was close enough, I took a chance and pulled at my right arm. Flesh. Oh, but the knife came out, and I grabbed it with my left arm tight. Uh, oh, I know it was dancing around, trying to get a clean shot. I moved around with him, trying to struggle to get my right hand between Wanda and myself. Let me go. Finally, I reached the 32 of my holster. <laughs> Renault went down with a sore leg. I pushed Wanda away. Renault was trying to get up. Why are you... He changed his mind. And Wanda... She just looked at me and said... You... Ah, there was so much left unsaid. In the meantime, a crowd had gathered, plus a cop. Later, at headquarters, after my arm was stitched, another cop picked up the stone where I'd left it in my landlady's flower pot. We discovered that the stone came in two pieces, had been cunningly stuck together with special cement and smoothed over. Fitting snugly inside was a crucifix set with one huge diamond and three rubies. The story behind it? Vincetti, the guy who came to see me, had stolen the crucifix in Italy. Then a stonemason put it inside the stone, engraved it, but talked when Vincetti left for Australia. He talked to Renault and Manello, who followed, joined a carnival in Fremantle, hired Goodwin, another thug and wonder, and finally located Vincetti a few months later. When Vincetti came to me, Renault had just missed sticking a knife in him. Later, he didn't miss. You know the rest. My arm? It's fine. I tried it out the next day. Around a blonde. Good night. Well, good acting from Ken Wayne on being stabbed. That's definitely a different voice for Larry Kent. The other thing in this episode that I thought about was the thing about Larry making Wanda drive the car to prove there wasn't a car bomb. I've never experienced that sort of thing in a detective story before. On one end, it does make sense to be a bit suspicious that there might be a car bomb. Though I think it would be a foolish move before they were satisfied that they had gotten the stone. But Larry's method leaves a little bit to be desired. It seems like he could just kind of check over the car. The back and forth thing was a bit odd. And again, you might think, okay, well this this is going to pay off later, but no, it doesn't. So, at any rate, we do turn to listener comments and feedback now. And we start with some local knowledge from Australia regarding SP Man. 
And Susan uh, writes in from Instagram, Hi Adam, a bit more info about Australian SP bookies. They were illegal, but everyone knew about them. The father of a friend of mine was an SP bookie, and no one was allowed to visit the house on a Saturday, as that's when the horse races were held. The police were known to raid the premises of both his house and the other SP bookies on a reasonably regular basis. Thanks for your interesting information that often accompanies your episodes. Well, thank you so much, Susan. Over on YouTube, Mark comments regarding I Hate Crime. I think these episodes are very good, Mr. Graham, and thanks again. Well, thank you so much, Mark. Now it's time to thank our Patreon supporter of the day. Thank you to Tom, Patreon supporter since April 2019, currently supporting the program at the Shamus level of $4 or more per month. Thanks so much for your support, Tom. And that will do it for today. If you are enjoying the podcast, please subscribe using your favorite podcast software, whether that's Overcast, Deezer, or the Amazon Music app at amazon.com slash otrdetectives. If you are enjoying the podcast on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and mark the notification bell. We'll be back next Tuesday with another episode of I Hate Crime, but join us back here tomorrow for Dangerous Assignment, where... And with that bit of cheerful philosophy, Colonel Diane and Dr. Mao take off. I stay in my room all afternoon, and then... A little before seven, I leave the hotel and start walking toward Dr. Mao's house. Suddenly, I spot one of the characters who was tailing me before. He's closing in on me, and he's got a knife. A rickety taxi cab comes cruising along about then, and I jump on the running board, pull open the door, and dive inside. Right into the lap of the other boy who was tailing me. So happy to see you. Oh, great. So long, Buster. So sorry, but you're not leaving. Well. So, you may proceed, driver. <laughs> When I come out of it, I'm lying on a couch in some sort of a mansion. There's a scent of jasmine in the air and a thin thread of music. The guy who conked me is standing at the door, and sitting across from me is a woman who's a dead ringer for the dragon lady. I hope you'll be with us then. In the meantime, do send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.